UDK 2018, a security roundup. Big round of applause for Maggie. Well, welcome back. I'll do my best not to put you asleep after lunch. Um, my name is Maggie Haudegi. I work for Intel for a team called Platform Armoring and Resiliency. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the features included in UDK 2018. Um, a few disclaimers, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just some, some of the ones we want to highlight or bring attention to. Not all of these were released this year specifically, but, but are included in this release as well. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, there's no such thing as security, only varying degrees of insecurity. So um, none of these features are meant to be uh, one size fits all or claim to be unhackable. Uh, this is part of our continuous effort to improve Tianocore. All right, so PAR. We are an interesting team at Intel because we are part of the team that develops the core. We're in the same extended team as, as Vincent, for example. We're also the team that supports Chipsec. Eric over here is the main maintainer. Um, we... Um, we do our best to, we're also plugged into Intel bug bounty, for example. So some of those submissions may be reproduced by us, propose, proposing fixes. So, so the creation, um, you know, we, we, we try to do a little bit of protecting, detecting, and recovering. You're, you're never done doing security, so this is a, a continuous process. And these features are examples of what we do to protect and detect security vulnerabilities for our systems. So why firmware? There are some clear advantages to gaining persistence on over a platform's firmware. Um, persistent compromise, stealth, bypassing security features, and the very obvious denial of service. And the reason why we think this has been more and more a thing is because the easier attack vectors that the network has been so overly saturated and hardened that people are now going down the stack to try to to do things there. So I think we're, we're in the age of hardening our, our firmware. Building a threat model. To me, a threat model is the cornerstone of good security. So really knowing what you're trying to protect, what your claims are, what you truly are not claiming, what the attack vectors are, who your attacker is, and, and, and again, like security, you're never done. You're never done with your threat model. It's, it's a changing, it's a living document that you have to maintain. As the ecosystem changes and your attackers change and even your, your features change, it, it, it'll be a, a changing document for sure. So now mapping the attacks to our platform assets. We have our boot media, runtime firmware that, that we, we mostly focus on, on protecting SMM, the rest we kind of rely on the firmware to protect. And we have our uh, hardware configuration, our locked registers from the core and PCH. So talking a little bit about the evolution of our threat model, there has definitely been a push or a challenge from the community to move that line of a physical attack to the left. Yeah. Um, so historically, it, it was down the middle where anything that was physical, we don't care. If you have physical access to the system, then you can explode it, hammer it, you can do worse things, you can just steal it. But, but, but more and more, and like Trammell mentioned in his keynote, for example, Boot guard is all the way down to open chassis, right? So for different features, the line is in a different place. And, and, and again, everybody has a different threat model. So th this is a fuzzy line, but the challenges uh, seems, the trend seems to be to challenge that physical access line. Um, here's some of our interfaces. We have hardware and firmware. We have our registers for processor and chipset. And then firmware-wise, we have our actual firmware that we care to protect for integrity. And together, it's a complex picture of, we have our assets, we have our um, attacker model, and, and, and we have the never-ending quest to 
protect, detect, and recover. So this was just a small intro to platform security to segue into a few examples of attacks and features that we've implemented to try to protect against them. Starting with uh, pretty recent attacks that have been presented at Black Hat and DEF CON recently by Eclipse, and we have an Eclipse site <laughs> on site. Um, so this is interesting because for the first time we're seeing remote firmware attacks where you can run arbitrary code on a platform remotely. Uh, my favorite was the ASCII calc pop. Um, so yeah, go check out their talks. Um, basically, the problem here is if you're doing HTTP and not HTTPS, you're vulnerable to spoofing, men in the middle attacks, or denial of services because you can't authenticate and verify that you're actually connected to the server you think you're connected to. So we now have HTTPS boot in Tiano Core. For all of these features, we have the source and the white papers, and this has the getting started guide. We've implemented the TLS protocol. And um, yeah, one of the other things that we do is we save our secret, our certificate in an authenticated variable, which is protected against replay attacks with timestamps and monotonic counters, and is verified with either the platform key, KK, or uh, DBDBX. Buffer overflows. It's funny to me that I even have to explain this, but basically um, when you overwrite the bounds of a, of a buffer, this may be a problem and it may be exploitable if you overwrite the stack or the heap. This has been a bug as old as time. Um, I just did a quick Google search and found like the first four hits on, you know, this has been a thing for a long time and will continue to be a thing. And um, it's a thing for EFI as well. Uh, so we've implemented guard page, and this works for stack and heap. Um, basically, what we do is we have a non-present guard page. That when it gets overwritten, you get an uh, immediate trigger, a fault, page fault exception is immediately triggered. This um, is better than not having it. It's 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 not a perfect solution. It's 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 there's large overhead in size, and performance. It, it it makes it slow. So it, it's mainly a debug feature. So making sure that um, all of your um, configurations run and it, this will fall flat on face, but it would also fall flat on face if if uh, you you we, we don't have exception handling. And, and we have limited resources, so this is one of the things that you can use to um, forward forensics and, and trying to figure out what happened if there was a problem or, or just as a debug feature to make sure that your configurations don't um, cause overflows. DMA attacks. So Crash has been famous, uh, aka, uh, well, they call him Dima. Dima. Yeah. Um, so he's famous for ThinkPon and, and, and a lot of uh, backdoors that he implements more recently in SMM backdoor that he did through Preboot DMA. There was a few seconds um, after PCI devices were enabled and before the system was locked where he could register uh, an SMI handler and do bad things. Uh, Ulf Frisk also uh, added this functionality to his PCI leech program. And in response, we now have IMMU. Our implementation is called VTD. And basically, we have DMAR tables where we specify what devices have access to. So a device will, by default, only have access to its own memory. You can tweak it to make sure that um, opcodes or y your, your devices have um, access to the things that they need access to. For example, device one is assigned to domains A and B. If it tries to access domain C, it will not be able to. We have a good white paper on it. Here's the source to it. Also has its limitations and it's also 
not straightforward to set up, and there has to be some time for someone to um, s set up all, all, all the resources correctly, but it's there and it can be used. So, yay. All right. And this one is not a hack or an attack per se, but it's a problem that we're trying to address. So whenever there's a bug, um, how long does it take to create, report it, get it accepted, uh, create a patch for it, have that validated, then send that to OEMs, have them validate it, and then actually have it available for people to choose whether or not they want to update their stuff. How long does that take total? And then we have the wannacries of the world, right? Like, this is a problem, and we're trying to do something. So we have capsule update, and this is something that we're trying to champion across the industry. Um, it's not new that we do capsule updates. It's not new that they're signed. Uh, we've been doing this for years. We actually open sourced the solution since 2016. Part of the motivation for open sourcing it was Mint Platform because we wanted to deliver a full open source platform solution and updates were missing. Um, there's, there's some new things for, the, for this uh, recent implementation. Um, we got source and a couple of papers there as well. Um, what else? Yeah, so basically what we do, we have a capsule uh, header that uh, creates an FMP protocol uh, that authenticates the payload, uh, does the update to the flash, and if it succeeds, it registers the GUID to the ESRT table. So what's new? So basically we tried to do it more versatile. Um, we can have uh, the public keys from a vendor. You can have your own public keys in there. Um, we've made it so that you can update only a piece of, of the firmware and not the whole thing. So you could just update the Emmy or you could just update a driver. And, or, uh, and you could do multiple things, uh, an OS patch, a driver patch, and a firmware patch. Bigger picture, we're trying to make this a push model um, through LVFS and FWPD. So hopefully, um, and, and, and part of the motivation behind capsule update is that we saw people were implementing them in a whole bunch of ways. So we're trying to standardize the way we do this as an industry. Um, so hopefully this helps. Um, a little bit of promo for the event later. So we don't expect people to just take our solutions and trust it. And so we, we, we want to take advantage of the fact that this is open source and invite the, the community to challenge it, to test it, to tell us if they think we can do something better. Um, we will be here the last two days of the con and uh, it, it would be great to, to see you guys there and create your own capsules and see if you can bypass the, the authentication. Uh, we invite uh, people who submit vulnerabilities to the Intel bug bounty. So um, yeah, th that should be good. I think that's all we have. Yay. <laughs> Questions? So I'm hoping for lots of questions, since we still have a very large audience. Raise your hands. Right. Always the same people. <laughs> Perhaps we're not scared of the microphone. Um, Maggie, on, on the slide about the firmware updates, you said users can enroll their own public keys. Is yeah. there some intention that users or computer owners should be able to sign their own firmware updates? Because, of course, I would love that, and I think many of us at a open source firmware uh, conference want to be able to, to do so. Yeah, we have that functionality as of right now. I don't know if that, this is just a, a test feature. So, but the, the problem, and you'll need to use the mic. Yeah. Oh. 
Oh, and part of the disclaimer, too, is I'm not the... Right, so if you have boot guard, you're going to have many problems. If you don't have boot guard, you may have to do an initial one-time replacement of the firmware so that you can enroll your own FMP drivers and the appropriate keys. But then once you've done that, then you can then you've got the appropriate public keys in your firmware, and then you could start doing signed updates from that point with your keys. And by one-time replacement, you mean? Yes. Yeah, Mr. Clippy and, yeah, <laughs> rewrite. One-time replacement. More questions? So if we have Chipsec guys here, so um, I submitted issue about MicroPython support. Yeah. And yep. would like to know what's your take on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're over here. It's, it's the Eric show. Yeah. You get the main maintainer of Chipsec. So, yeah, um, we've started the port to uh, support Python 3, 3, 4, 3, 5. So that will get us to supporting MicroPython. Um, so we're working on that this year um, and trying to get that worked out. There's going to be a number of bugs, plus there's a lot of stupid things that we have to fix, like, you know, switching from the old class model to the new class model, which affects every single, you know, test in the, uh, test, in the test suite. So needless to say, there are a lot of opportunities for error, and um, we're going to generate a lot of bugs. So we do, have a, um, we do have a branch set up for that. We're working on it. Um, we want to get that done this year. And then MicroPython uh, will be, uh, it's Python 3.5, correct? Yeah. 3.5-ish. 3.5-ish. Let me but give a background. So. For, for those of you that don't know, um, there's been a Python 2.7 port uh, for UEFI for quite some time. And the goal of that, uh, yeah, I was getting to that. The goal of that was to be able to take Python scripts um, and execute them at the UEFI shell. Because um, firmware testing is obscure enough as it is without introducing yet another shell script, which we did, yet another C programming style which we also did. And the QA people don't really know how to do that, but Python's really common in QA and automation environments. So we were supporting that. And Chipsec takes advantage of that so they can execute the same scripts in pre-OS environment and OS environment. It's based on Python 2.7. All good things must die. That's got an expiration date of 2020. So we would rather do this work. Now we, I, I worked on Y2K personally. I don't want to wait till the last minute to do this sort of thing. So. Uh, we've, instead of porting to the full Python 3 tree, we looked at MicroPython as an alternative because it's Python 3 compliant, but also it's better for a constrained environment like a firmware environment. You're not going to be doing crazy multi-threading in these environments. You really want something that can just get in and execute a small memory footprint. So the MicroPython port is available in EDK2 staging. That's where we put up branches before we consider them to be ready to go to public, like full public. Once that branch has gone through its sort of submission phase, we're going to take the MicroPython uh, submissions and put them in the main MicroPython tree, something we didn't do with the original Python tree. So that'll be part of the main project. We have to work through their process and submission. And then everything else, the testing framework we built around it that has all of the you know, stuff you need, like the accesses UEFI and hardware resources, that will remain part of EDK2. And so during that transition, this is when Eric and company are going to be working on getting Python 3 to be the scripting style uh, for the chipsec examples, because you can't just take the Python 2 stuff and run it directly. So yeah, after we get that uh, Python 3 support done, um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to need, to, we'll have to write the OS helper, helper level. And at that point, um, uh, it should be fairly, that should be fairly easy because we're no longer having to build our own stupid version of Python 2 and have all of our hooks in that way. We're actually going to be able to hopefully submit them so that they're built into um, MicroPython and you'll be able to grab that and then just run Chipsec um, on top of it without any special modifications. Mm -hmm. So that's going to start, well hopefully we'll start that um, at the end of this year and depending on how hard it is to get the uh, OS helper in. We'll get that done hopefully early um, Q1 of next year. And also along the lines of Chipsec, there's a talk and a workshop on Friday. So be sure to check that out. Excuse, excuse me. <laughs> so um, 
Are you willing to accept for Chipsec, uh, for example, some OS helper layer for, I don't know, bits or bare metal stuff yes. that can run on top? Okay, that's great. <laughs> Please. Okay, we, we have 25 minutes. Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't be giving so much matcha. Yeah. It's too matcha. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about the part where you mentioned the HTTPS support in the firmware, mm -hmm. where I think you said that the certificate was also included in the firmware in that case. Um, how do you handle certificate replication in this case? Certificate replication? Yeah. Revocation. Yeah, that's why. Revocation. Great. Well, yeah, we, we uh, use the authenticated variable to update it, correct? Yeah. The other yeah. disclaimer was I didn't implement these features, but. Yeah, I think the replication model for HTTPS is different from the one for security, so that's Mr. Mike. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the mm -hmm. question is about revocation. If you look at the standard model for secure boot, there is a, um, there are two databases. Uh, there's a DB, which is the list of valid hashes, and then there's a DBX, which you can use for essentially revocation. Right. Um, that's updated from the OS level, so any OS that has support um, and you get OS updates for uh, has the ability to publish to DBX. Um, the thing that we would probably have to take offline to check on is if that revocation is also the one that r works with HTTPS, because that uh, enrollment, certificate enrollment process for HTTPS is a little bit different. So that's probably one to, you know, throw that question up on the EDK2 developer mailing list or... Yeah or um, pass it on to one of us. But the mailing list is always a good place to, to literally and figuratively hash those things out. More questions? I'm a bit astonished that TLS 1.0 and 1.1 are still supported because they have severe flaws. Are there any plans to implement TLS 1.3? because the IFC was standardized uh, last month. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Question for J1? Yeah. Um, yeah. So for, for the developers. The for so for anything in Tiana Core, um, there's a, if you go to tianacore.org, there is a uh, link to a page on, um, you know, community involvement. And part of that is, is reporting bugs. Uh, so we use Bugzilla for that um, rather than the GitHub process because it allows us to have a kind of a secure black box for things that fall into um, please don't zero day us categories. Uh, but there's also a feature request category. So TLS 1.3 sounds like a feature request. So that can be thrown in there. And then that way you're, the, the advantage of doing a feature request through Bugzilla through uh, versus emailing one of us or finding us at the reception tonight is that Bugzilla remembers things in the morning. <laughs> and also, it's, as long as you're not reporting a, uh, something that falls under security embargo, it's public. So it's a visible workflow, and everybody gets a chance to uh, talk about it and throw their two cents in. So we all have Wi-Fi. You know what to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> Create and plus one. And check the page. <laughs> That was sort of the expected answer to TLS 1.3, which is absolutely okay. But the other part of the question, um, what about TLS 1.0 and 1.1, and especially version negotiation, we have seen a lot of downgrade attacks to web servers and so on. That sounds a little bit dangerous. Can you actually shed some light on that? Um, but try it. If you can do it, report it, bug bounty. Yeah. yeah. Get your CV, get thousands of dollars. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> I, I do it. Okay, little background on me. Uh, I studied in Bochum, you know, where the guys are who basically always do the downgrade attacks like Robot recently and stuff. Got a Pony Award. So um, maybe that's a bit of an encouragement to maybe create a bug request that 1.0 and 1.1 are supported. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So the nice thing about the network stack in, in uh, Tiano Core, which you may consider a bad thing about it depending on, on how many of the buttons you push, it's super modular. So you could probably chuck TLS 1.0 and 1.1 in your configuration and only support TLS 1.2. Um, now, of course, finding those buttons, well, we're having workshops on Friday and Saturday, but we, we can, <laughs> the, the network stack is extremely well documented. I'm gonna give credit to J1 and the team uh, in China that did that work. Their, their wiki documentation of that is very, very good. So I'd probably poke down on that and see if you can figure out, at least on your implementation, how to, to knock those things out. Um, do you know how much the OEMs keep of Tiano Core? Because you said now there are many buttons. How many buttons do they push? Maybe wrong. You want a real life example? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's lots of others. Um. So, yeah. Getting down to the actual OEM and how much of you know the uh, code that they actually keep and how many buttons they push that are incorrect, it's there's a lot of hand the change the code changes hands a number of times um, because in most cases we'll do our best to validate a reference platform internally and that code will go out to OEMs and IBVs and all, a number of other people and they're all going to make platform decisions and it just moves on and on so the, it the code changes hands so yeah it's very possible that you know someone is going to say, well, I don't like that feature, I don't like the security feature turned on because it makes my life more difficult, or it doesn't allow me to do something that uh, you know, I want my users to do, so they'll turn it off. And it's, you know, between that, you know, they're making feature decisions and they're making you know, decisions about what their customers want. And so, yeah, a lot of things can happen between you know, the beginning and the end. <laughs> While we're discussing, uh, you know, pie in the sky future features, uh, what are your thoughts on eliminating SMM and using some of these ultra? <laughs> so that's, I suppose, question one. And two, making use of some of these uh, these new roots of trust that uh, the, uh, the hardware vendors are starting to um, uh, implement and proliferate. Okay, so first part on eliminating SMM. Um, stand up for that one. I know everyone's going to stare, stare at me intently when we talk about this. <clears throat> okay, so SMM is one of those things that, you know, you, it's there in the hardware because some customer needs it for an interesting feature. However, we all know that it has, it's complicated to, to, to do right, and it has pitfalls when you do it wrong. Um, it also has some you know, because you're basically stepping away from the host process or running in like a ring minus one, ring minus two kind of situation, um, it's not ideal from a visibility standpoint. It's hard for the OS to audit what's going on, which can create some problems. So we have a lot of initiatives going on to try to reduce the use of, or in some cases, if you happen to work for a company that, that designs processors for a living, uh, look at different architectures. That, those are longer term solutions because one day if you just say, we're gonna take out SMM, um, then it impacts the way that a lot of current OS and software assumptions are made and the way a lot of customer assumptions are made. But it's something that we actively talk about. Um, we're looking more at looking at features like say runtime variable access and seeing if, can we make runtime variable access go away or work differently so that it doesn't have a requirement to do it in SMM because you put so many weird requirements into it that the only good way to implement it is through um, something like SMM or another side channel or back channel. Saying side channel in this room is kind of dangerous. I wasn't talking about that different side channel. Um, that gets down to the second question where you're looking at different ways of doing root of trust. And those are really compelling um, and it's, I'm not sure if that's a th thing. I think Vincent's approach, he was talking about earlier today, of code first, standard second, is probably the way to go with that. Because I, there are so many alternatives for that right now that I don't, my personal feeling, uh, I don't really think that we know which one works best for a general situation. Every customer that has put investment into coming up with a different way of handling root of trust has done so for a very specific business reason. 
whether those match up with everybody else's, I think it's too early to tell. But have, it's, it's obvious, you know, the way that Intel does boot guard, for instance, that essentially is a root of trust preservation. So there's a lot of interest in making sure the root of trust isn't compromised. Um, so I think looking at something that's broader than like what we've done in the past with TPM is definitely necessary. But yeah, I, SMM, probably not the best way to do most of what we do with it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of concerted effort from uh, folks from a, a specification and an implementation standpoint both to try to reduce the use so we can figure out how we can wean ourselves off of it. Love that you guys actually ended up presenting with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Oh, oh <laughs> so close. So close. <laughs> um, you said with the capsules, for example, you can update individual pieces of the firmware. Um, for example, the crypto library, if there was a patch for this, could you, because I don't think it's the shared library, you can just swap out, can you maybe patch the crypto library on its own? Not by itself. Like yeah. uh, big segments of, of, of the firmware, like BIOS on its own, or the ME on its own, but a driver, but not a small part, yeah. All right, I guess that runs up the roundup. Thank you very much again. Thank you.